Hey everyone, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very, very excited for today's guest. His name is Yogi Hendlin, and he is an environmental philosopher and public health scientist. He has a PhD in environmental philosophy from the University of Kiel, Germany, and holds graduate degrees from the London School of Economics and UCLA and bachelor's degrees from UC Berkeley. He's currently an assistant professor in the Erasmus School of Philosophy, core faculty of the Dynamics of Inclusive Prosperity Initiative, and academic lead of the new MA in Sustainability Transitions at the Design, Impact, and Transitions DIT platform at Erasmus University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He is a research associate in the Environmental Health Initiative at the University of California, San Francisco, working on the chemical industry documents and fossil fuel industry documents. He's worked off and on at UCSF since 2006, 2006 both as a pre-doctoral and postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Medicine and Center for Tobacco, Re Con Tobacco Control Research and Education, focusing on topics such as public health policy, corporate malfeasance, and conflicts of interest, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about heavily in this conversation. He's also currently editor-in-chief of the journal Biosemiotics. I will also say on a personal note, we spent a lot of time together recently here in Costa Rica, and I, I will say this, this might come across as hyperbole, but uh, he's one of the smartest, most interesting people I've ever met in my life, in real, in real life, and, and just a pleasure of a human being. You know, it's just uh, all of our time together was filled with fascinating conversations on uh, a wide range of topics. And, um, and that's why I'm so excited for today's guest, because it's someone that I've had the pleasure of spending time with, and I know just how smart and well-educated he is on really important topics that are particularly important for this time in history that few people are aware of. So with all of that said, Yogi, um, you're an expert on the science around environmental toxicants, their role in human and global health, and the nature of big industry in terms of influencing that science. Can you give a broad overview of, of the work that you do? Sure. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Ari. Uh, it's a pleasure. I really appreciate the work you're doing too to keep people healthy and um, to help you know go to the root of uh, how to stay healthy in a time when it seems like everything is stacked against us to be healthy. Right? Um, we have uh, yeah climate meltdown. We have an infectious disease pandemic. We have currently a, a war going on in Europe. Um, and we also are living, um, you could say, in a time of peak exposure to chemicals. Um, you know, we had the First and Second World War, which really um, uh, buffed up our um, military industrial complex, uh, which largely was dr driven by mining and uh, chemical exploration. So we have a lot more toxins in our uh, atmosphere. And even those of us who are living uh, very privileged lives are still exposed to these uh, toxins. Um, you know, you, they're, we are porous animals as humans, and there's no way we can live in uh, personal commodity bubbles, even if we live in nice places, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I really look at because it's very easy to think that um, you know, if we buy the right things, if we, um, you know, drink, I don't know, bottled water or live in nature, that we're going to be safe. Uh, but the fact is, in our air, our water, uh, our soil, and the temperature, right, this, this is really elemental, it's like four elements stuff, um, we are being exposed to immense disruptions, mutations, uh, in our environment, which of course are impacting our organisms as humans. Um, so that's one of the things that I really look at. I call it um, based on um, this emergent subfield industrial epidemics. Mm -hmm. And I don't just confine that to, um, you know, cancers and heart disease um, and diabetes from, you know, high sugar consumption um, or smoking. 
um, or exposure to petrochemicals, I see it as impacting every aspect of our life. Um, for example, you know, uh, the coronavirus itself uh, hitches rides on uh, environmental pollution. So every time we're driving our cars, we are in essence contributing to particulate matter, two point, uh, PM 2.5 it's called, which is the perfect carrier uh, for viruses. And so until we clean up upstream, you know, at the very most fundamental levels of our, um, uh, of our social design uh, of how we get things done, uh, we're not going to actually solve the problem. It's just going to be in a thousand patches and people are going to be wondering, you know, what went wrong and why we're all getting autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, this, this link with air pollution and, and SARS-CoV-2 is very interesting. I, I was it, attuned to that research quite early on in, in the pandemic. And there was a number of papers that were published on PM 2.5, this form of small particulate air pollution um, in high concentrations in certain cities and COVID mortality being higher in those areas. Um, and the, there were sort of several, a couple different theories. I, I don't want to digress too much on COVID. I know we're going to focus more on environmental toxicants, but, um, there were a couple of theories that emerged from that. One was the idea that maybe br sort of breathing in the air with high levels of PM 2.5 would uh, cause chronic damage to the lungs and sort of um, depress one's immune defenses and make one more susceptible upon exposure. But then there's the other idea, which has not been talked about much in the research, maybe I saw it mentioned in one paper, the possibility that the virus is actually traveling on the uh, the, the small particulate air pollution. Um, do you, do you know, uh, I, I always kind of wondered to what extent, like how far it could travel on that, you know, is it the case that it could travel, you know, intercontinentally on air pollution from China over to the United States and, you know, around the globe in that sort of way and, and stay, um, what's the right word, vital, vital, not vital, viable. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, for, for those, those long, uh, periods of time, or is this something that it's just more likely to be, you know, from person to person, a few feet apart, but just carried easily, more easily in a place with higher air pollution? Yeah, I, I, I can't speak to that with certainty, but the virus will, you know, die within uh, yeah, a few days, uh, if it's not, you know, if it's just like on a surface. Um, but yeah, there's, um, no question that the pollution in our air is directly uh, linked with the incidence rates of um, this, this virus and many other diseases, uh, mm -hmm. to be quite frank, infectious and chronic. Um, and a lot of my work actually breaks down this divide between chronic disease and what, or what's sometimes called communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. Because as it turns out, a lot of these non-communicable diseases are actually quite communicable, but their disease vector is not, say, a mosquito biting you or a virus traveling, um, you know, in uh, the the air or in uh, aerosol particles, but instead um, by um, certain uh, design of our society through um, industrial processes that do not take care of all the immense costs and. Uh, health effects and environmental effects, um, both at that moment and downstream. Right. It's interesting to play with the semantics around what is a communicable disease in that way, because we define it in this, in a sort of rigid way, like infectious disease, it's synonymous with in microbes. You, you spread bacteria or viruses from one person to another. Um, yet if one takes a more global view and a, you know, a, a, a long, a, you know, sort of 30,000 foot view over a long period of time, and you start to look at, let's say obesity and the factors that led to the obesity epidemic, um, the change of nutrition to a processed diet in particular, uh, being the major factor, environmental toxicants being a major factor. And you start to see, well, if you, if you tracked that history of like how that is traveling 
around the globe. It's a longer time scale than how long it takes for a virus to travel around the globe. But it, in a way, it almost travels around the globe in a similar way. It's like as ideas and ways of living are, you could say, communicated from one group of people to another, so too these, these diseases come with it. Anyway, that's, that's where my brain went with what you were saying. Absolutely. If we fast forwarded, um, you know, industrialization and colonialism and uh, mining of, uh, yeah, mineral ore, um, and we started in certain places in Europe and saw it spread throughout Europe and then saw it spread um, to the Americas, uh, to Asia and um, in, in Africa and beyond, uh, you would definitely see a very similar disease vector. Um, and of course, I don't think it's just point source. You know, there's been a lot of work, you know, Jarrett Diamond and others looking at, um, you know, why Europeans? Um, and I don't think that it's just a uniquely European problem. You know, we have Easter Island, for example, but um, there is definitely these different stages of, um, you know, when we are creating pollution. Right, this pollution as such is a relatively recent phenomenon. Maybe um, you know, in, in a, any major forms, um, you know, with with mining would be the, the first bit. There's a great book by uh, Fabian Scheidler called "The End of the Mega Machine" um, that basically chronicles this over thousands of years. Um, you know, with Roman Empire, where they were at one point. Um, uh, they needed a ton of silver a day to pay their 200,000 mercenaries to keep on getting new lands and keep on conquering in order to get more resources. So you see like the cycle was you needed to conquer new areas to pay the people who are conquering new areas. But eventually that Ponzi scheme runs out, right? You know, it's, we're not going to be able to mine materials from asteroids or Mars, um, you know, anytime soon. And even, even if we could in a thousand years, why would we want to? Why don't we just, you know, uh, make use of like the infinite abundance that we have on this planet and find ways uh, to, to use those materials and not just, you know, throw them away after, uh, you know, 18 months because uh, they're designed to break through planned obsolescence, for example. Yeah. So I want to get into the heart of why you're here. And for everybody listening, you know, you, you have such a diverse educational background and as far as what you're interested in and what you teach about. But for my audience in particular, there's, there's a couple big lessons on what I want them to get from you. One is the sort of the nature of environmental toxicants, which you've touched on a bit, how widespread they are and what effects they have on humans. And the other aspect, which I really want to focus on, is how industry corrupts science. Uh, this is something that you've done a lot of research in for many, many years. So um, can you give maybe a broad overview? How should we get into that, that topic? And uh, you've co-authored a paper, I'll also mention, called The Disinformation Playbook, How Industry Manipulates the Science Policy Process and how to restore scientific integrity. This is, this is such an important topic because I, I've, I've found, I've been shocked really in the last two years to discover how many people just don't understand that science is not science and that depending on who's funding it, has, it has a major impact on things. So I'll let you, you know, I, I, that, was, that was a very general sort of overview, but I'll let you kind of explore and, and educate on those topics piece by piece in whatever way seems appropriate to you. Sure. Great. Thanks. Um, so Ari, you know, to begin with, I think it's important to remember that science as such has always been a, uh, an agonistic process that is instead of being antagonistic where we're fighting against each other. The idea is that the best ideas will percolate to the surface and that there will be disagreement along the way. And even when we think we're hundred percent certain in the future, any new finding can um, sort of cause us to revisit even sort of bedrock basic science claims. Richard Feynman, one of my heroes uh, and you know, 20th century Nobel prize winner um, talked about, um, there was this study um, 
he talked to, talks about this in his book. Surely you must be joking, Mr. Feynman. Where you know he's he's a, a PhD student at uh, Princeton, and um, he goes to some August English professor's house uh, on Princeton, and they ask him if he would like um, you know uh, lemon or milk with his tea, and he said both because it was his first time doing that, not realizing that of course that makes the milk curdle and that nobody wants both lemon and milk in their tea. And so surely you must be joking, Mr. Feynman. And he found this empirical um, study that showed sort of the, the action potential for some physics question. And all of his theoretical um, uh, work, you know, was always off from this. It was just one time, it was never repeated, this experiment. And um, so after long enough of coming up to the same answer theoretically and the evidence just being off, he, he did the experiment again. And in redoing the experiment and having others then confirm and replicating his, you know, that same experiment, he realized that the original sort of sacrosanct values in that data set were wrong. Mm. There must have been some sort of error. And we have that all the time, especially in uh, the human sciences, right? Uh, in health, uh, medicine, technology, uh, with uh, psychology, especially, you see we have a, it's called a, a replicability crisis that a lot of the science that's published, um, you know, of course there's intrinsic interests of scientists to um, feed their family, to become famous, to be, get rich, None of us are immune to that, but what we can do is become aware of it, right? That's, and that's why instead of this idea of trying to make scientists saints, I'm instead trying to just have transparency and disclosure, right? Um, and that's part of what integrity is about, but you need to sort of systematize that in the scientific system. Otherwise, it's very easy to roll out sensationalist sort of science claims that might not be double-checked, that might not be reproduced, of course, you might have um, a claim that comes uh, for um, a, a new paper, new experiment that is well qualified and guarded and saying, under these conditions, perhaps maybe this is true. And then it gets to the news media and you get headlines of saying, you know, chocolate cures cancer, if only, right? <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, there's even like a, a joke Twitter account that talks about um, adding um, in mice to all of these, uh, you know, News um, wine cure, you know, a glass of wine a day stops, uh, um, you know, heart disease. Yeah. Studies found like in mice, right. Mm -hmm. And so many of our, um, at every step of the way in, in the scientific process, there are many different micro hurdles that need to be, um, uh, that need to be jumped uh, but, or uh, accessed. Um, but it's not that simple to just, you know, say, okay, this is a possible thing going on here in mice or, um, you know, uh, in, in this very small sample of people and then extrapolate it to be a universalizing issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that unfortunately happens in our marketing day and age almost all the time. And so the actual science that we're getting is at best fragmentary and uh, at worst um, completely sensationalized, which makes it so that we lose trust in science. That's the end result. And it also stops the sort of um, the checks and balances of a literate and educated public on the claims that are coming out of these papers and that are being taken up then by political or industry interests. Right. We can talk about, um, you know, industry funding of science uh, when, whenever. But um, just to give a little bit of background of even the best scientists are not immune to some of these uh, incentives, perverse incentives often. Isn't there an incentive to find something in the research that you're doing, meaning uh, have some kind of positive or negative finding that so and so did result in some effect as opposed to no effect? Absolutely. 
um, yeah, that's sort of you know confirmation bias uh, is one way of looking at it. Um, there's also uh, you know you're much less likely to be published in a top journal if you have a finding where we spend all this time and energy and money and you know people dedicate their lives for five years to this thing and it didn't work. Right. Right. Nobody wants to read about that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's, it's crucial that that information gets out um, because then, you know, maybe other people <laughs> um, uh, will uh, replicate those bad studies or those studies that have, you know, uh, that don't come to um, fruitful findings. Um, and so that's why um, there's, uh, th there's um, this journal that I'm uh, on the advisory board of, I, I really should know their name, but something like the, the journal of, um, you know, sort of uh, failed experiments, right? Mm -hmm. Where people get to publish all the things that didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'll send you a link for that just because <laughs> I think it is a nice innovation, right? That there is more and more um, uh, awareness in the scientific community that we also need to be publishing papers um, that found, okay, it didn't work. You know, we found nothing or there's no link where we thought there was a link at, which doesn't show anything new. Uh, except that, you know, we're just confirming that there's no link, which yeah. everybody thought, you know, between say cancer and, um, you know, sunspots. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's talk some specific examples. Um, you have co-authored a paper on tanning beds. It was a systematic review of the research on tanning beds and a look examining the nature of industry influence on the results of those studies. What did, what did that paper find and, and what kind of lessons are there, broader lessons and that maybe we'll talk also other examples of? Sure. So um, just to answer your previous question, and then I'll answer that one because I realized that, okay. yeah, the disinformation playbook, my, my apologies, um, I was lucky enough to partner with the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, you know, some of their top research scientists to, to work on this paper. Um, they've done an incredible work at showing how industry at every level uh, does impact science. And um, I can actually, um, let's see, uh, share screen. You can see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is um, one of the, um, yeah, this is one of the slides from our paper, uh, uh, Read et al. And it talks about um, how science can protect the public from, you know, from uh, from grifters, from what Adam Smith called the rentier seekers. That is people who are trying to um, extract value out of commons and to sort of privatize the profits and co collectivize or you know, nationalize the, uh, the harms, right? The effects, the costs. And so um, there are many different intervention points which, uh, which industry can interfere. And that includes um, faking the science. Uh, you know, we have uh, looked a lot at um, industry funded, fu funded science um, at this uh, UCSF uh, repository of previously secret industry documents. This is how I got into the business of uh, understanding conflicts of interest in science. Um, and it's, called uh, industrydocuments.ucsf.edu. I'll give a link for that as well. And we have 100 million pages of previously secret documents of um, the tobacco industry, the food and beverage uh, industry, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, including um, opioids and you know the sort of follow from the opioid epidemic, uh, the chemical industry and the um, fossil fuel industry. And what we see is that a lot of these uh, companies, like for example, ExxonMobil, will um, you know, knowingly fund high profile scientists at you know, top institutions um, in order to yeah, fake the science, to get findings that are diametrically opposed to what they actually know from their own non-published private science mm -hmm. that these industries do. Because the, I, I have to be frank here, um, the scientists of these massive transnational industries is far better than public science because, well, 
they don't have to play by the same rules. They're not publishing it. They're keeping it private just for their own internal use. An example is ExxonMobil knowing about um, which sites were completely covered in ice and undrillable for oil, but they knew that if they bought them now at pennies on the dollar, 40 years later, due to climate change, they would be easily drillable. And so that's exactly what they did from their own incredibly <laughs> researched um, internal science. At the exact same time, they were funding all sorts of um, yeah, public leaders, scientific leaders uh, to do scientific um, uh, experiments and to write papers in the top journals to show that global warming was not a problem did not exist, that humans could never uh, really you know, impact mother nature. All of these old tropes were being used under the guise of science. And so that's just one example of, of, of many, but we see, you know, for example, the manufacture of uncertainty, also how industry undermines um, scientific protection of the public. And that's, for example, the indoor tanning industry um, and the American Sun Tanning Association spreading misinformation about the health benefits of artificial tanning um, in order to uh, change norms that would disallow um, policies uh, you know, against um, sort of carte blanche uh, um, uh, marketing uh, for, for the industry. Um, and, and as you can see, you know, there, there are many other um, ways in which uh, industry fear interferes but with just with just science. go into those yeah. go into those other ways briefly so there there's a large segment of people most people are actually listening to this rather than watching the video so uh, sure great um so um science can also protect the public by uh speaking out right um and saying hey you know um thalidomide which is supposed to help morning sickness in women is actually producing uh birth defects right and our science shows that, and we need to, you know, have uh, policy change so that we're not, um, you know, creating tragedy for, for these families, and um, you know, creating um, starting points for for future generations that are, um, you know, more difficult. And so, industry uh, can harass scientists who speak out, um, and they can retaliate uh, against the view statements and research of scientists uh, that's inconvenient um, for their own position and their uh, short and long-term profit. Um, for example, uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, threatened to sue a scientist for seeing him to walk back his findings that one of the company's diabetes drugs was increasing patients' risk of heart disease, right? We're sort of in this, and I'll get back to this later, this whack-a-mole, um, uh, sort of chemical, but also medical industry where, you know, you take this drug to, um, you know, uh, like a diabetes drug to, to deal with a social disease. Diabetes is not uh, um, something that you get um, in indigenous uh, societies or in um, societies that haven't been industrialized. This is something that comes with, uh, you know, white bread, sugar, high carbohydrate diets, low nutrient diets. It comes with the green revolution and uh, fertilizers and taking all of the um, uh, nutrients, uh, sort of the micronutrients out of the plants by feeding them too many macronutrients. Um, you know, that's how you get diabetes. So when you take a diabetes drug that's, that's gonna give you heart disease, you know, you're just down this rabbit hole of like, you know, taking the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, but you're making your body closer to collapse with every drug you take in our current system. Right. And you it's know, really I, uh, doesn't just, have to be that way. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll mention one quick personal um, aspect of this. I, I was in medical school for a couple of years and one of the things that drove me crazy and was actually a big part of why I left is being in the internal medicine wards and seeing uh, really unhealthy, mostly obese people with diabetes, with heart disease, who were on, I almost couldn't believe this, 
12, 15, 18 different prescription drugs for all of their different symptoms and all of their different diseases, being fed a typical, you know, Western diet, typical hospital food, garbage food, and being taught nothing about the actual causes of their conditions. And, uh, and if I said anything, as I was in this environment as a student, if I said anything about the utter absurdity and insanity of that, I was looked at as the crazy one for suggesting that I knew better than, uh, than they, you know, how arrogant of me to suggest that, that I would know how to do things any better than the way that they were doing things. And I, uh, I mean, to me, it was just absolute madness and I, I couldn't take it anymore, but, um, just an example, uh, as an example, you know, how often I'm, I hear this about. Ari from, from, you know, from, from doctors or, uh, you know, uh, people who are, you know, uh, have, have exited, uh, the, the medical world. Um, it's, you know, the, the inattention to the, the whole environment, you know, mm -hmm. and all of our inputs, uh, all of our stimuli is just incredible. And this idea that we could have silver bullets, you know, one size fits all, I'll just, you know, take this and call me in the morning and it, nothing else has to change, not lifestyle, not, you know, abusive parents, right. Or abusive environments, not, you know, a, uh, a location where you're right next to a factory that's polluting your air. And that's why you have asthma, you know, or the fact that your father smokes, um, you know, not looking, not a asking these questions is that to me is, is ignorance um, because it's really um, this sort of black box, sort of like put this pill in and you get this thing out on the other side. Um, and in the last couple decades, you know, we have, I would say, in the forefront of um, uh, sort of, you know, academic thought, we've gotten beyond that, right? There's this famous paper, uh, which, which I really, you know, appreciate, and, and it's called uh, Weird, you know, the weirdest people in the world. And it uh, stands for um, Western educated, um, industrialized, rich democracies, right? And it's by Joseph uh, Heinrich, uh, Stephen Heine, and um, Ara uh, Noren Zayen. And, you know, this paper and all of their subsequent work um, really looks at the fact that most of our, most of our problems in terms of health, in terms of, um, you know, our, our, our physical, our mental, our emotional um, problems that really haunt us are industrial diseases, you know, and, and the, even the way we think is affected as a result. Um, and that, you know, we, we do these uh, biological experiments on college kids, mostly from the US, 90% uh, from Western countries. And very few of the findings of these experiments are, uh, um, yeah, extrapolatable to, uh, to other populations. And even you could say, you know, if, if I have genes in one way um, and, you know, I have a gene mutation, maybe the same drug isn't gonna affect me. Or if I eat a certain thing in my diet, the medication may be only 50% as effective. And yet almost never is this sort of personalized medicine uh, looked at. And so here, here's sort of the, the aporia or here's the tension. On the one hand, we have this move to personalized medicine, right? You can have like gene-based medicine, which itself, is mistaken because we're not just genes, we're primarily our environment. Genes matter, but our environment matters even more. On, and that's for the people who can pay for it, right? On the other hand, we are degrading our environmental commons, our health commons, even our, uh, you know, our truth commons, our uh, what we call uh, epistemic commons in philosophy. You know, the, the things that we can rely on the, the idea that I can ask my neighbor for, you know, some eggs if I'm out and that, that you know, I, I'm not worried about my neighbor hurting me, right? Because <laughs> it makes such a difference in our overall stress levels and our allostatic load, right? So when we're 
in a society that's cre increasing our allostatic load to the breaking point for almost every single human being in that society. And then you're going to tell me, you're going to give me a pill and it's going to make it all better. Um, I, I've never seen it work. I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, for, for people listening, not familiar with that term, allostatic load is basically like total body stress load, stressors from all causes, you could say. So uh, Yogi, do, do you want to, uh, did you talk about the last two on this list by credibility, manipulate government officials? Uh, I haven't. I'll just very quickly go through them. Yeah. So as, as the scientific community speaks out and says, hey, we're killing ourselves by this thing that we thought was good because it's giving us certain benefits or at least some of us, right? We all like our devices. I'm not about to, you know, give up my computer anytime soon, but, you know, do I really need a new computer um, every time mine breaks every two or three years? Like, does it have to break? You know, why couldn't it be modular, uh, modular and I could just, you know, get a new camera or new screen, you know, easy instead of having, you know, the parts glued in uh, so it's impossible to repair. Um, you know, oftentimes industry will harass the scientists, they'll buy credibility uh, by, um, you know, uh, for example, British Petroleum uh, gave BP, gave uh, UC Berkeley uh, $500 million to create like an energy um, center, right? But it's very hard to, um, you know, think about uh, transitioning to renewables or to getting off our addiction to oil and gas when your funder is, you know, one of the biggest uh, oil companies on earth. Um, it just, you know, makes it difficult. And, and BP can then say, we're partnered with all of these extremely prestigious uh, institutions, and we're going to, you know, put their logo on our website. We're going to say, you know, the director of the institute that we funded at this top university thinks that it's fine to continue doing whatever we're doing, whether it's, um, you know, DDT or uh, fossil fuel uh, production or, you know, uh, yeah, drug manufacture of drugs that hurt people. Um, yeah, and, and this is a method and a mechanism to distract um, from the real, just the basic industry harms, right? It, it instead pushes an industry agenda, which is based on uh, delay, right? That's number one. You want to try to extract as much profit as possible before you get caught and denial saying it's not here. It's there. Um, perfect example in the 1960s, um, uh, fat came, um, you know, under attack in the eighties because in the sixties sugar was under attack and people were trying to eat less sugar. Um, and, the sugar industry uh, paid these Harvard scientists to say it's fat, not sugar. So I grew up, um, and, and of course, you know, these, these scientists who got, uh, they were pariahs for saying, no, sugar is causing, causing metabolic disease. A calorie is not a calorie is a calorie. It's what matters what's put into it. If you, you know, give somebody pure sugar in a Coca-Cola, um, you know, day in, day out, that is going to cause disease. Um, and instead, they blame fat. And so I grew up eating reduced fat everything and hating it because I was never actually satiated and satisfied. And eating tons of sugar and feeling lightheaded all the time. Um, and that was entirely an industry agenda. And, and you know, heroes, one industry against another, and they just happen to be more successful than sh the sugar people. But, um, you know, and, a lot of our, our laws also reflect industry interests. You know, finally, uh, scientists can, um, you know, work with decision makers to implement public safeguards, right? Clean our air, clean our water, make sure our food is not sprayed with pesticides that are going to, you know, uh, cause um, birth defects or are going to cause cancers. You know, that seems like a pretty low bar. Um, and yet, um, you know, industry, manipulates government officials uh, and influences the regular regulatory process with money, resources, or power, oftentimes behind the scenes. Um, and this just goes on and on. And, and I could give you, you know, countless examples of how this, this works. But for me, you know, after, I don't know, um, uh, yeah, 16 years of looking at tens of thousands of industry documents, 
from many different industries, you know, you see certain patterns occurring. And when it occurred to me how much of our normal understanding of our culture, of even, you know, our, in, the, in the 60s, they had um, Exxon sponsored, uh, they were called Humble Oil back then, uh, Disney comics. They were t t teaching kids about energy and it was sponsored by ExxonMobil and completely written by them. You realize that pretty much everything we believe and think and know is industry agenda. We've been gaslit all the way down. It's brought to you by, da, 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 with, it's brought to you by so-and-so industry without you realizing it. Well, that's the, the even more potent way of doing it, right? Where right. you don't even, it's seamless. The, yes. the virtual reality aspect of being in another um, uh, sort of framework um, doesn't even come to consciousness because we're so embedded in it at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question that you're not going to like, and you're going to be resistant to it because you're an academic and you're a professor and you're a scientist and you're not going to like it. Okay. But I'm going to ask it anyway. And I'm curious what your response will be. So there are some people who are going to hear everything you just said and will still kind of conclude, okay, well, maybe there's a few examples of these things here and there. Okay. Thalidomide and Vioxx and opioids and, um, you know, ExxonMobil and some of the other examples you gave. But by and large, science is this, you know, beautiful entity that's bringing us the truth. And, you know, these industries are, are working towards our benefit and pharmaceutical companies are, you know, we can trust their science. And um, a, a little a little digression, I, I would say there's there's also, you know, I grew up since I was a little kid. Science has been my passion, health science, since I was 12, 13 years old. Um, and my conception of the, the, the sort of the entity of science as a, as a young kid was always, and even up till quite frankly, pretty solid, even relatively pre COVID, uh, it was always what I now realize is a very childlike, very naive worldview and, and view of science, which is that sort of science is science. There's all these brilliant altruistic scientists working to find the truth and find cures for disease and help the world. And of course, on an individual level, there are lots and lots of good people involved, but I absolutely, and I think most people do not realize the extent to which the entire process, the entire entity of science has been so extraordinarily corrupted by financial interests who are literally producing fraudulent science, manipulating the science, manipulating statistics to manipulate the results of the science that they're doing um, or presented in misleading ways, who are, you know, the file drawer effect, all the, the negative studies that they, they, they conducted, those never see the light of day. They just end up in a file drawer, never even submitted to journals for publishing. Um, the extent to which they are um, suppressing dissenters suppressing people scientists who are voicing opposition as you just said and and also paying off politicians to enact policies you know uh, uh, that are in their financial interests um the extent to which what's public the science that's published in journals and media is so extraordinarily influenced by people who have a financial agenda who are literally producing propaganda to convince hundreds of millions of people to believe certain things and presenting it as science or presenting it as factual news uh, in, in mainstream news. Uh, and and the, just to, to realize how much of this is propaganda has been a, a total shock to me, particularly in the last two years. Now, my, my question to you that you're not going to like is if you were going to generalize from everything that you were just talking about, what conclusions should people draw as far as 
how much should they trust science? How much should they trust an article they see in a, a journal? How much should they trust a headline they see in the paper that says, according to studies, da, 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 da. Um, should we, if you were going to say like on a scale of one to 10, how skeptical should people be and cynical should people be of that, whether that is actually truthful information or not, or whether it is some kind of essentially propaganda meant to serve some financial agenda? What would be, how would you grade that? I obviously understanding the limitations of generalizing and that there are exceptions to the rule. Thanks for your question, Ari. And uh, I'm going to, you know, raise you an ace. Um, <laughs> so uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway write in their book, The Merchants of Doubt, that it's not just financial interests, it's mm. also ideological interests. Okay. Right? It's the cold warriors who, you know, feared any sort of impingement upon individual liberty, a very, you could say, state of exception, war-driven, anti-communist notion that they basically saw any sort of environmentalism, taking care of the environment, taking care of our own surroundings as uh, watermelon work, right? Red on, uh, uh, green on the outside, red on the inside, right? That any sort of social program or social welfare was actually communist, right? Mm -hmm. So you get these false equivalencies all the way down. And what's super interesting for me is that their book and many others, um, uh, colleagues of mine, you know, uh, Naomi Oreskes is, is, is one of uh, my, my heroines uh, that I really uh, look up to, um, show that ideology plays a huge role. You know, we know that now um, if you're researching food in top medical journals, you have to disclose your own diet because, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, not, it's not just enough uh, the fact that there are studies saying mangoes are good for everything funded by the mango industry. <laughs> and yes, there apparently is a mango industry, but um, uh, you know, it's also the fact that if I am a fervent believer in say a keto diet, um, that the findings from the studies that I will look at, um, you know, in my sort of uh, literature review, in my systematic review, in my meta-analysis and in my own experiments will have unconscious bias, you know, a confirmation bias of what I already believe um, towards delivering similar results. Mm -hmm. And so this question of belief in science really is, again, like realizing that we've been gaslit all the way down by for profit at the expense of collective health agendas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, goes even deeper, right? It's the, the idea that science needs to have um, triangulation, right? We need, I, I would say, you can never read one study and draw a conclusion from it. Um, but, you know, as far as I can say from my own point of view as a scientist, you know who is working for whom, what their agenda is, and how good they are. Mm -hmm. If they're sloppy with certain work, you know, my, my work on tanning beds uh, with, you know, our, our lead author, um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Lenny Linos, a professor at Stanford who uh, led this study, you know, she has been working on tanning beds and, and, and cancer and sun exposure and cancer for decades. And she has done it at the top universities in the world. She has, um, you know, put herself, put her neck out and gotten, you know, personally attacked. Uh, for some of the, the papers that she's written and made. And that's usually a good sign if, if somebody's getting attacked by the industry. Um, <laughs> you know, to be honest, I've had Philip Morris uh, write hit pieces on me, for example. Um, and so that's usually a sign of cred in my book. And so knowing who authored the papers from my point of view is really important. Or if, uh, you know, somebody I really respect says this paper's legitimate. I'm going to rank it higher in my first reading, right? Most of our understanding of the world is, you know, the first five minutes, right? If it's, the world is made out of these um, sort of chain links of trust. And 
So if I trust you, Ari, and you say, hey, check out this paper, I'm going to be predisposed to read it in a positive light because you recommended it to me. And, you know, that's where our media needs to really play an important role here. Um, this has been called in, in some cases the cordon sanitaire, the, the sanitary cord, right? So Belgium, for example. Um, so Belgium's interesting because they are more critical um, uh, and, uh, of, of uh, any sort of fascism, you could say, than most other news media because they have a policy for all their journalists that they are simply unwilling to platform certain ideas and people. And I think that this is, even though we might say, well, this is censorship, right? Or this is closing things down. I think that there is an interesting balance here because we all do think that there are certain things that are obnoxious and abhorrent to us and that will actually acidify and melt down our society if too many people start believing in that narrative and start acting according to that. So it really is this, you know, it's this sort of intergenerational project of science, um, which is totally flawed from the beginnings. If you look at science, it came from alchemy. Alchemy was trying to find the philosopher's stone. And there it was basically people trying to get rich or live forever. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to place undue sort of reverence uh, for science. At the same time, I think there are ways for scientists to earn the public's trust. Um, you know, I think it's sort of like a Janus faced question where you're looking one way at, you know, the public trusting scientists, but also scientists earning the public's trust. And that has to be also a full time job, you know, and it can't be marketing. It can't, you know, you have to have a product that's good. And that product is integrity. And integrity is not something that happens, um, you know, in a bubble, uh, small digression. If I may, um, the, the philosopher, one of the most famous alive, uh, Anthony Kwame Apia, uh, he talks about, you know, we are products of our situation. If you look at experimental psychology, um, good people can do bad things if they're put in, you know, put against the wall. Bad people can do good things when they're given an opportunity or a chance. You know, he has this uh, example that he talks about of a earlier paper that was done um, on Princeton seminary students. They were studying theology. These are good people. They wanna help the world. They had a sermon, you know, you have about 30 students. They had a sermon on the good Samaritan the day before. And then they have a very important meeting with the Dean. And in one scenario, you know, you have 15 students, uh, they show up, um, they have to walk past the church. There's a beggar at the church asking for alms. So something like 60, 65% of those students uh, who had plenty of time to get to the class, they gave something. Now, the, that was the control group. The other half of the group, another 15, 20 students, they had a road closed where they would normally park to get there. So they were 10, 15 minutes delayed and they're rushing. They see the same good Samaritan, exact same example. They gave maybe, 20% of the time, right? It's not like they it was bad versus good uh, seminary students. They were simply in a rush and couldn't do it. And all of these factors in our lives that make us not able to do the things that we would like to do, that we could do. You know, I, I know when I'm sick, I'm less likely to, you know, put uh, my compost in the compost, more likely just to throw it in the trash if it's closer by. Um, and all these little things really have an impact on our society. So I, I, I don't think that I can answer your question about you know, a generalizable rank because I don't think that that's how science should be looked at as this thing where we trust it a little bit or we trust it a lot or we give it full credence or no credence. I, I think that that's part of maturity and intellectual maturity for each and every one of us you know, to, to be um, not alone, not, you know, these lone wolf sovereign, uh, you know, have to know everything, have to master everything, but to have a network of people that we trust, that we can trust, and that we can more or less be like, oh, okay, great. Ari said this, I'm going to take a look at it. Um, yeah. And I will 
um, uh, you know, take a look at this thing and maybe it can make my life better. Excellent. That was a very sophisticated and articulate evasion of my, my question. <laughs> so, okay. I'm not going to let you off the hook though. I liked everything you said. However, let me, let me phrase it this way in the last two years in particular, I think there has been a narrative that has been pushed on the population via lots and lots of propaganda um, that if one has distrust, if one defaults to some level, either a mild or moderate or strong level of distrust and skepticism, cynicism of industry funded research, that makes one a science denying conspiracy theorist. And what is maddening about this is to have a, lar a huge portion of entire populations who have no scientific background, no scientific literacy, no research into any of the things that you, for example, have specialized in, like actually examining and researching the relationship of industry influence on scientific results, who don't know anything, even one layer deep of the thousand layers that you could explore on that, who default to the assumption of, who default to complete trust of industry-funded science, and who are convinced that anybody who doesn't default to complete trust of industry-funded science is some kind of crazy whack job conspiracy theorist. Like you and I, knowing this topic, you obviously know it way deeper than I do, uh, but I know enough to be pretty skeptical and to look at who's funding this study and to look at the greater body of evidence and to make sure there's no statistical manipulation and to consider the possibility that if it is industry funded, there's a good chance that it has been corrupted by that in some way. And to have people who have, again, no scientific background, no, no expertise, no science, no even basic scientific literacy, then looking at my positions, like I'm some kind of crazy whack job for not trusting that, that, that science in the same way they do is ridiculous and absurd to me. So what I'm, what I'm getting at, what I want, I, to be blunt, I would love for you to tell those people why they should not default to complete trust of industry-funded research, or you know, since it's not always clear if the research is industry-funded, default to at least some mild level of skepticism of, of that research and not just assume that it's true. Absolutely, yeah. I you know, have written about this also the sort of lack of uh, pluralism, right? The idea that we can have um, many different, even opposing opinions, but be sort of on the same project, on the same team, wanting, um, you know, wanting say health for a population, wanting um, the environment to get better and have different ideas of how to do that or different ideas of what the real problem is even, right? That's another, Part, bit of it. Um, and yeah, these, these last two years have been incredibly divisive and almost vertiginous. You know, we've been so confused as to, um, you know, uh, fights with, with people who we thought we knew, and then they come believing something different or imposing their beliefs on us. And it has felt, I think, for many, really, um, uh, really difficult to, to have open and honest conversations. And feeling that, uh, yeah, well, one, that we can speak our minds, and two, that we can just respectfully disagree. Um, and I think part of that is that we're in war times, right? We had uh, 20 years of uh, the war against terror, um, and then we had uh, the corona pandemic, and now we are in another war, uh, or hopefully we aren't in it yet, but there's, you know, a, uh, the, the Russian Ukrainian war that's captured the world. Um, basically uh, in, involved in it. And 
it's very sad when you have, um, first of all, one size fits all uh, way of approaching things, because we know that, um, for example, in many subsistence economies, um, that not being able to go to your job for a lockdown has caused starvation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a, a really good um, article in, in this, um, unfortunately now um, uh, defunct um, uh, <clears throat> a newspaper called The, Cor the Correspondent, um, which was a offshoot of a Dutch um, uh, paper. But um, this, I, I believe, uh, Nigerian um, author, she said, you know, why social distancing won't work for us. And it was talking about cultural differences there. And I think that this is the first time in uh, history that we've had an organized for one size fits all top down policy. Um, and I think that for, you know, white color workers, it wasn't much of a, of a bother in a certain respect compared to people who are, um, you know, frontline workers or uh, essential workers or uh, need to work every day in person, you know, manual labor uh, to, to eat. Um, and so there has been publication about these topics, but they haven't, you know, filtered to the top of the, the news stream or the Twitter feed. Um, and so I generally find that in academia, you do have more, um, more freedom to actually discuss, um, yeah, inconvenient truths uh, than um, in popular discourse. And that's a whole nother topic. Um, but absolutely science has become politicized because we have been in a state of exception, a wartime sort of where democracy is uh, in many ways, you know, and science is a democratic enterprise has been shut off to a certain extent and people with um, disagreeing opinions uh, I believe you know the Barrington Collective uh, or the uh, what are they called the the, the Barrington great. Declaration mm -hmm. yeah the great Barrington Declaration um, you know they had some different approaches to how to deal with the virus which basically you know one year later uh, is happening worldwide at this point um, but at the time they were derided, um, you know, and they were um, not able to be part of a, um, a sort of integrated scientific discourse. Instead, it became very fragmentary where you had, um, you know, a dominant discourse and a sort of subterranean or a pariah discourse. And you had different people, you know, glomming on to each one. Um, as if they weren't also in conversation with each other, as if um, there aren't, you know, many degrees on a spectrum of uh, ideas, beliefs, uh, perspectives, you know, um, or as if science were a monolith, and then this was pseudoscience over here or bad science. Um, and I think that that is very difficult because it also undermines public trust in science. Um, and you know, that's, I would say, been sort of a strategic error, uh, the, um, the dealing with the corona pandemic, um, because, um, you know, we most of the time are wrong, and we're proved wrong in the future. And when we think that we have a monopoly on truth, that's a dangerous thing, not, you know, not because we just because we could be wrong, but because of the things that we're sort of willing to do to people who disagree with us when we have a monopoly on truth um, or think we do. Um, and that's something that there's, there's gonna take a lot of healing, I think in science as well, to get to a place where people can trust science uh, more, trust public health, trust governments, um, because there's been at, at various turns, um, you know, what I've described in, in the paper um, of the law of the excluded middle um, as this, this, um, this idea that we're at war with each other and that we're willing to dehumanize each other or write each other out, you know, have people be persona non grata because we're generally assigning more um, exaggerated forms of 
what whatever they think and believe, we're probably thinking that they're far less re reasonable and uh, uh, willing to you know have a conversation uh, than um, we are. And of course, there's a lot of things that led to this. You know, the whole uh, QAnon, um, you know, the timing of the, the the QAnon activity, the storming of the state capitals. You know, um, when people get violent, that generally um, gives other people carte blanche to be violent back to them. Yeah. You know, if you were looking for an excuse to dehumanize people, if you start being violent, like that's going to do it. Yeah. And so it's really difficult because then you get anybody else who's, um, uh, you know, questioning non dominant or, or, yeah, questioning dominant narratives and, um, you know, doing research on other issues that are really important to integrate with that. Um, there's a tendency to clump in those, you know, you could say sincere, um, sincere, uh, yeah, mild skeptics, or I, I don't even like the word skeptic because they're just pointing out other aspects of the same picture that are, you know, um, not being examined or not being chosen to, to, to be examined in, in the dominant discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a difficult time. I, I would say for science in general, um, we have we have a lot of uh, work uh, to do to re-earn uh, the public's trust, and I don't think that's going to happen overnight. Um, and I think that it's going to take many forms. But we have to realize that it's, you know everybody has different opinions, and so even if uh, you had two uh, people who were very skeptical of say lockdowns. Um, and the necessity or impact or the desirability of them. And, you know, showing that through sort of uh, traditional academic means, um, they're not gonna believe the same thing. And if we treat them as believing the same thing, that's going to further ostracize them, further put them in a different epistemic community. Like, you know, and so you have groupthink sort of in various directions where you have different collectives of groupthink and it doesn't help anything because it makes us all more wrong. Yeah, and and it's amplified further by modern technology, social media, and and the AIs of what news we're being fed that uh, verifies and confirms all the things that we already wish to believe. So it creates these pockets of um, realities, distorted realities that people confuse for objective truth, and then they encounter some other person's little micro bubble of reality that they're being fed that's different from their own. And they think, oh my God, that's totally crazy. You're a nut job. And in, because there's, there's so many instances where there just aren't any shared or very few shared objective facts that we can all agree on, you know, where it used to be the case that, you know, we all shared roughly or mostly the same sort of objective facts about what is happening, what has happened, and we can have different opinions and interpretations of what, what are the causes and what we should do about it. Now it's actually the case that we just have a fracturing re of reality where people don't even have any shared understanding of what took place or what is taking place. And it's, it's very problematic, as you said. Um, it's also, I think, as far as trust of public health officials, it's, uh, it's probably never been lower in history at this point, seeing how wrong they've been on so many things. And I, I would love to go on a COVID rant here, but I'll um, not list off all the details of all the things they've been wrong about. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, as an interesting aside, I think related to this, to me, the, the, the scientific hubris that we've seen in the last two years of people with very limited information insisting on their right, that they're right, insisting that we know everything, and then imposing um, the grandest population level medical experiments in history, both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions. It's the, the hubris in this is just remarkable to me. And I'll give one unrelated example of why. Um, I was watching a, uh, um, a thing on, like, I think it was Bill Nye, the science guy with my five-year-old son, Matteo. 
uh, on how planes fly, what creates lift and how this works, you know, how air and the wing interact to create lift that makes the plane fly. And they were, this was an old video. It was from, I don't know, probably 15 or 20 years ago. And it was talking about Bernoulli's law. And this is how fluid moves through and across things in, and how pressure builds up on one side or the other that the, and how this creates like a pocket of high pressure and a pocket of low pressure and that this results in lifts of the wings. And apparently that model of physics of how planes fly has been the, th the thinking, the established scientific consensus for, I don't know, 100, 200 years or something like that. I don't know how long it's, it's been around and that's been taught and taught and taught. And this is obviously a topic that's been studied for at least a century or more by physicists. You'd think that if we have 100 plus years of studying it, we understand it really good by now, you know, and we, we sort of know everything there yeah. is to know. And then um, I was building paper airplanes with my son a few days ago, and we watched another video of this guy who set the world record for um, throwing a paper airplane the farthest distance. And he's talking about all these different paper airplane designs, and he goes through the physics of how each one works and the different forces that are, you know, thrust and drag and lift and gravity and how these different forces interact depending on the design of the airplane. And then he said, oh yeah, you know, it used to be thought that um, Bernoulli's law dictates the lift. And actually now we know it's this whole other thing. Uh, I forget what it's called, the Canton effect or something, some word with a C, um, that is actually this totally other thing about how air wraps around surfaces. And that is actually the main thing that dictates a plane's flight. So Again, wow. this is a, a topic in science that's been studied for over a century, and we still got it wrong, you know, and, and then to imagine, yeah, I mean, the, the absurdity of, you know, having a few weeks or a few months of data on something and then acting like we've got it all figured out and then imposing medical interventions on hundreds of millions of people. If, if you understand the history of science, this seems like just a horrific idea to me. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know if you want to comment on anything I said there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a brilliant example. Um, and I, I do think, you know, that's why uh, the concept of epistemic humility or humility about the knowledge that we hold is so important, um, you know, for, for all of us, uh, scientists and citizens alike. Um, on, on the other hand, just, you know, in defense of public health for, for a minute, I think that, um, you know, if we had an asteroid coming at us, right, mm -hmm. we would want to do something about it, right? If you saw the movie, Don't Look Up, you know, blow up the asteroid, like, or, or the meteorite, you know, we, we, we don't need that, like, yeah. get, get the meteorite out of here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think with climate change, you know, it's, which the, the movie is a par parody of, um, that's exactly the problem. Like, we, we've, we see this slow moving, um, you know, uh, asteroid coming at us, and we've done less than nothing about it. We've emitted more CO2 into the atmosphere in the last 30 years since we had the first IPCC reports than in the entire history of our species prior. So we're just, you know, stupid at this point. Like, we, we see it coming. We've had plenty of time. We've had a consensus. People have known about climate change for 150 years now. And, um, you know, or just, oh, we'll, we'll see when we get there. So that's like the other extreme, uh, right? Um, so the question then becomes, at what threshold do we say, okay, it's a state of emergency where we have to su suspend uh, rule of law, democratic processes, and just take decisions on a top-down level? So, I mean, you could say, well, maybe we should never do that. And I uh, would sort of agree um, that maybe that's never really the best model. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, decisions have to be made. You know, if uh, they took this Imperial College London uh, paper seriously, that, you know, this could be like the um, 1918 uh, American plague that's called the Spanish flu, but actually it came from the US. Um, Spain was just a neutral party. So they decided to call it the Spanish flu to not piss anybody off. Um, you know, if it was going to be that bad, proportionately per capita, 
it might have made sense to do like the policies that happen. And, you know, if that was the information, but the thing is you have to update in real time, mm-hmm. right? You have to also generally use a precautionary principle. So yes. um, with, with public health, there's this idea of, you know, prevention is better than treatment. And, you know, it comes from John Snow and the cholera outbreak in London. And he just took out the, the, uh, the water pump handle. Right. You know, it was a little bit more complicated than that, but it happened relatively quick. They were actually able to take action quickly uh, by taking out the point source of disease. Now, what I would have done if I ran the circus is the moment we heard about this thing um, in China, China would have done the responsible thing instead of trying to save face, would have just said, okay, we're closing all of our borders, closing all of our airports, nobody in and out. We're going to quarantine everybody for a few months. And none of this would have ever happened. If the UN had, you know, been responsible, the WHO, in uh, seeing the threat for what it was, they would have shut down all airports worldwide. Yes, that would have inconvenienced a lot of people, but much less than everything else that's passed uh, in the last couple of years. Um, You know, I think that because we didn't want to rock the boat early on, or we wanted to save face, we ruined it for everybody. And so that's why I think that there's a time and a place for decisive action Mm -hmm. and we blew it. And because we blew it, we blew it big and we kept on blowing it. So we had to ratchet up all the sort of draconian (laughs) measures um, and and also safety precautions because we were afraid and didn't know what was going on because we kept on making things worse by not actually confronting it or doing our due diligence in one way or another. And, you know, I am not an expert uh, in these things. I just um, am well aware that this could have been prevented if it had not been for shame and guilt and ego and sort of short-term economic gain. Okay. Let's talk about glyphosate. Sure. So talk to me about glyphosate and what is the nature of glyphosate? You, the, the, the effects on human physiology are controversial. There's been, geez. I'll... I don't think they're controversial. I, I think they're controversial okay. for one reason, one reason only. Industry. Uh, and, and that's because of, uh, yeah, industry-funded science and industry interference and in regulatory agencies. Okay. So they're controversial in the sense that I have, quote-unquote, evidence-based friends, doctors, and people in the fitness industries um, I would call them evidence-based internet trolls who generally default to aligning themselves with whatever science comes out of pharmaceutical companies or big industry, big agriculture. And they sort of are operating from a worldview where everything within conventional medicine is the science. Everything outside of conventional medicine must not have any science. To support it, otherwise it would be in conventional medicine. Um, pharmaceutical companies are working towards our benefit. Big agriculture companies, Monsanto, etc., are working towards our benefit. And all you know, the GMOs and all these chemicals are necessary to produce food in abundance to feed the world. And anybody who questions that is just some kind of you know pers- backward thinking person who's opposed to scientific progress. And um, anyway, the, these kinds of people, because of those worldview, those kinds of assumptions of how they interpret things, uh, will argue, uh, oh, Monsanto's perfectly safe. Uh, yeah, glyphosate is perfectly safe. And, you know, the, 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 one of the heads of the company even offered to drink some to show how safe it was. And, um, you know, th- these are minuscule amounts. They can't possibly be doing any harm. These, these sorts of arguments. And anybody who's concerned with the harmful effects of it are just, uh, you know, these natural health whack jobs who are obsessed with, uh, um, you know, the, the, the role of chemicals and, you know, who are afraid of chemicals. So paranoid. Yes. Right. right. So Let's anyway, that, put that's, it out there. That, that's the, the, the thinking from some types of people that I know. Um, Tell me about what are the physiological effects of glyphosate, and then let's talk about industry influence on uh, people's perception of that or or the use of it. Sure. Well, I actually can provide a slide on this uh, if you like. 
But um, please. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> even Monsanto sponsored studies in this meta analysis uh, from uh, ATSDR. And let me again refresh my memory of what that stands for. Um, yeah, they're the uh, US Agency um, for Toxic uh, Substance uh, Disease Registry. Yeah. So, yeah. So they're, uh, yeah, Toxic Substances and Disease reg Registry. And, and they showed that. Um, in their meta-analysis that um, it's indeed very clear that um, there's a clear risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma relative to self-reported glyphosate use or exposure. Um, and my guess is that it's, it's much, much worse than, than that uh, um, because the industry is uh, sponsored uh, papers, which do show a positive correlation, probably are downplaying it, but no matter. Um, it's very clear if you look at the uh, IARC report in 2015, um, which is the International uh, Agency on Cancer Research uh, for the UN, and it's pretty much the highest um, body on cancer in the world. Um, and they only look at substances if they're pretty clear that they're going to already say that there's a problem with it, right? And glyphosate came up many times and they didn't do a monograph on it. And finally they did in 2015 in March. And of course, um, you know, Monsanto uh, also played a role there in um, having industry funded scientists downplay the effects on um, multiple myeloma um, without, you know, disclosing the industry funding of that scientist. Uh, who I have a paper coming out on that. Um, so actually the charge sheet of the diseases that uh, glyphosate causes has been, uh, had its wings clipped at every opportunity by the industry. And in fact, um, Monsanto and their allies um, also um, right after the 2015 IARC report came out was a bombshell because everybody was expecting it, but once it hit, it actually changed their profits, right? So they had already set up beforehand the US EPA and the European um, uh, uh, Food um, and Safety uh, Agency, EFSA, to uh, come out with reports saying that it's inconclusive, right? To try to undermine the power of the IARC report. Um, well, in 2019, I held a conference with uh, the uh, head of uh, IARC who wrote the report and the head uh, research director of EFSA in Europe. And they were agreeing on all the science. They just were reaching different interpretive conclusions. Um, so many people in the last couple of decades have reported gluten intolerance, right? There's a whole industry for gluten-free uh, products at this point. But why is that? Were we always just you know, weakened uh, to gluten? Is gluten just some evil? You know, is bread gonna kill you? Um, probably not in its natural state. But glyphosate, um, what it does is it disrupts your gut microbiome and your microbiome and your brain too. Um, so glyphosate has been heralded in agriculture as a once in a century chemical because of its relative low toxicity compared to DDT. But that's a pretty low benchmark to try to surpass. Um, and it turns out that GMOs, the first GMOs were created not to put more vitamin A in rice, but to soak up more glyphosate without dying. Mm. So a lot of our products and wheat is one of the highest GMO products around. It's not, it's not clear whether it's harming us because it has genetically modified, uh, you know, uh, uh, because it's been genetically modified 
or if it's because it's been genetically modified to soak up tons of glyphosate without dying. And so it's likely that we have a strong confounding effect for a lot of GMOs because most GMOs are actually created by the same uh, pesticide companies to take resistance to the chemical that they're spraying all around, right? The herbicide or the pesticide. Glyphosate's technically an herbicide, but herbicides fall under the larger category of pesticides. Um, and it's, it's just incredible to see that the history of GMOs is so that they could sell more glyphosate. Mm. And the consensus around GMOs being safe also is completely tied in to the fact that if you delegitimize GMOs, you're going to sell less glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And I don't think many people are aware of the history of that, um, but it's an important one, right? Because if you go back to the origins of things, you sort of have a better idea of why we're so confused now about whether something's good, bad, why some scientists, you know, why there's consensus that GMOs are safe, um, which has been bought, bought and paid for with billions of dollars over almost uh, half a century uh, by the largest um, agrochemical country co companies uh, in the world. So, so glyphosate works on the shikimate pathway, which humans do not have, but our bacteria do, our gut microbiome, which if we didn't have, we would die, right? So the idea is that you know, no animal cells have the shikimate pathway, but uh, plant cells do. So you can, you know, it, it will harm the plants. It'll kill all the other weeds, um, which actually are, you know, co-symbionts if you want to get biological about it. Otherwise they wouldn't be growing there. Um, but, um, you know, we, we can kill the plants and not kill the animals. And that's why glyphosate was so, you know, revered as, as a chemical. But it turns out that we're not just all animals. You know, that the nine out of 10 of our cells in our body, they're much smaller, uh, are non-human cells. They're not animal cells. They're viruses, uh, nematodes, fungi, um, bacteria. And we need a lot of these because almost all of these, if we're healthy, um, are part of your, you know, God-given microbiome that with, if you didn't have, you wouldn't exist. You wouldn't think thoughts. You wouldn't have emotions. You wouldn't have a body. Uh, you would not be able to survive. And so they forgot that bacteria also have a shikimate pathway and that when you harm that in us, it also harms us. And so biologically, that's the pathway um, in which it causes, uh, you know, terrible, you know, crippling life-ending disease uh, for, for countless numbers of people. Okay. So that's, that's the piece of how glyph glyphosate is bad for us. What about... And you've touched on the industry influence on this, but do you, do you want to comment a bit more on that aspect of things? Um, sure. So there's no such thing as a solitary chemical, right? If you buy Roundup, um, you're, so if you buy Roundup, you're getting a cocktail of chemicals with all these adjuvicants that, uh, you know, uh, are sort of supplementary uh, chemicals to make the glyphosate do its thing. And some of these are surface, sur surficants, surfactants. Which, uh, surfactants, thank you very much. And the surfactants make sure that the chemical stays on the plant and you know, kills it. Um, and if you didn't have these, it wouldn't work nearly as well. But when you do have it, there are these chemical reactions which have uh, uh, synergistic, or I call them dysergistic mm -hmm. effects on the body. Um, because they potentiate uh, potential harms in, in glyphosate. So for example, there are, um, yeah, adjuvicants in the US formulation of glyphosate that are barred in Europe. So glyphosate uh, pesticide uh, products in Europe have a very different form formulation than the US because Europe has higher standards and uh, you know, does not allow a lot of these other chemicals to be used on, on food products uh, because they harm human health. So you're not just getting glyphosate, you're getting a whole uh, 
smorgasbord of, of chemical cocktails that uh, potentiate each other and cause more, more damage. So there's generally a big problem in all of these regulatory agencies of compartmentalizing the sort of active ingredient, right? So they'll look at glyphosate by itself and its harm on human health, mm. not Roundup. You know, they're not looking at Roundup as an entire suite of chemicals together, which would give very, very, very different results. And as far as I know, almost no um, regulatory agencies look at the chemicals as they're going to be used in the wild. Mm -hmm. They're looking at isolated chemicals and just from a pure, you know, laboratory chemistry perspective. And that gets into our waterways, um, you know, that gets into our skin, respiratory. If you live near a golf course, you're three times as likely to get cancer within 500 meters of a golf course because of all the pesticides uh, and herbicides they spray on the greens. Um, you know, that's a really sad statistic um, because that's completely preventable, right? There, there are ways of having nice greens, like in Scotland, for example, where the game began, um, where they don't use these, you know, they have natural grazing if, you know, uh, uh, in order to, to get their greens uh, nice and manicured. And they're also not quite as perfect as on a field that uses a ton of chemicals. But, you know, if you walk barefoot on a golf course, you can get sick. And if you do that a lot, you can have you know, permanent problems. Um, and this is well documented. And this is because of glyphosate and other chemicals that are used to maintain those grains. So my question would be, are we willing to have slightly less aesthetically um, shaved greens and not kill our kids and our elderly? Or, you know, are we willing to sacrifice all of that to have like an Instagram photo? Yeah, well said. Okay, Yogi, I want to be respectful of your time. You've spent a lot of it with me. Thank you so much for spending so much of your day with me. It's always a pleasure. I would love to chat with you for five more hours. Um, I would love it to wrap up if you could succinctly, briefly um, leave people with sort of maybe two or three things. Are there two or three takeaways that you think you want people to get from this? You've obviously touched on so much and it's in such a nuanced way. What, do you, what would you say are the sort of two or three big take-home lessons you would like people to, to walk away from this with? Sure, thanks so much for having me on your show, Ari. Uh really enjoyed the conversation, even when you uh, were pressing me in directions I, I didn't want to go in. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's, you know, a, a couple things. One, you know, it's really important to understand that the biggest threats we face are those that accumulate over a long period of time and from many different directions, not the ones that suddenly appear to us, right? And, like blow up in our face. Mm. The things that blow up in our face happen because of you know a death by a thousand cuts and cuts that we were not noticing or not wanting to notice, not wanting to clean up, not wanting to do our work, our due diligence along the way. Um, and so health is a team sport. We're never going to get at it alone. We need a community of people living together to say no. No, it's not worth it to have a, a McDonald's in our community, even though it might be tasty, it might be whatever. Some people might want it, but the impact it's going to have on our community net is going to be negative. And we need to find better ways as citizens to say no when we are you know, uh, offered foods with chemicals or foods that we don't even know what's in them. Uh, you know, just basics like... Who's polluting our water? What's going into our water? Um, you know, these very elemental questions are important for us as a community to figure out, to organize, and to fix because nobody can do it at, alone, right? Not, no man is an island. You know, you can't live in a fortress pretending you're safe if everything around you is decaying. You know, sooner or later, your air, your water, the temperature is going to affect you, is gonna harm you. 
Yeah. So we're not safe until we're, we're all safe, really. And then finally, um, this idea um, about what I call the chemical Anthropocene, that we have changed how the, the earth operates, how we operate, how all living beings operate because of the new chemicals, synthetic chemicals we've created and the other naturally occurring ones that we've concentrated and extracted. Um, you know, we have created pollution. No other creature creates pollution. This is something that we started and we can stop. And it's not like it's a species, you know, we're some horrible species. These are historical accidents that had a lot to do with people who didn't have enough time or they were scared and they were in a military situation, they were in war. And so they felt, well, if, if we don't, you know, uh, go nuclear, they will. Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of our history of contamination, which has taken away from us our, our commons, right. It's appropriated, uh, the, the rivers that we can drink. It's appropriated the, the nice climates that are right in that, you know, uh, uh, not too hot, not too cold region for human life to flourish, you know, this heaven on earth. That has happened through accidental but deliberate action by many, many people making many, many decisions. And we can change that and change our own health and the health of our community by making new decisions. And so if we've been harmed by a death from a thousand cuts, we can heal from a thousand virtuous acts working together. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it. Brilliant as always. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next one.